very good afternoon to one and all i am professor prasad rao dean school of management mohan babu university tirupati i welcome all of you to this august gathering where professor ravi kumar jain the founder director of symbiosis institute of management hyderabad now former director now he is uh, consented to be the guest of the day before i introduce the guest i would like to talk briefly about the association of indian management schools aims friends over 34 years ago a national conference of heads of management institutions in india was held <clears throat> at the indian institute of management bengaluru from 28th to 30th april 1988 it reviewed the status of management education as obtaining at that point of time in the context of the policy implementations and implications arising from the national education policy 1986 and the resultant program of action and resolved this assembly of heads of management institutions resolves that a network of management institutions offering post graduate courses be constituted pursuant to the above resolution a glorious and highly impact making body called association of indian management schools aims a network of management institutions offering post graduate courses was born on 27th august 1988 in bengaluru it is a not for profit make organization registered under the karnataka societies registration act 1960 it's an independent networking body for professional development of management education in india games takes pride in having nearly 600 top class institutions like iims isb aski javier institutions belinker institute of management narsimhon ji jamnalal bajaj ifai mbi imi and the list goes on and many management departments of universities are also became members of games it is one of the largest networking bodies of b schools in the world moreover it is the official representative of indian management schools in india as well as in some international forums there are major activities and objectives of aims such as to provide dynamic network of institutions engaged in management education training research to help in accreditation process of management education institutions by suggesting specific criteria and evaluation standards of institutions and their programs to institute or cause to set up local regional chapters at convenient locations in india and to promote the objects of association more effectively to take steps for the development of management literature case studies teaching material books etc relevant to the indian context to actively promote linkages between management education institutions in india industry business and also government to strengthen institutional capabilities through faculty development faculty exchange and enable better use of instructional facilities to strengthen and organize seminars conferences management training research consultancy publication activities in furtherance of the objectives of the association the major activities include policy advocacy role annual management education convention awards coming to the awards on the basis of national uh, competitions or selection the following prestigious awards which are in the shape of citations medals presentation and done during the annual con convention uh, aims b school innovation award aims it for best teacher award aims ramaswami p iyer best young teacher award aims best case award aims best student paper award aims jl batra best research paper award aims national management week award and aims rcm best business school director award also friends the most prestigious one among various awards ravi j mathai national fellow award uh, this award is the flagship award 
which is also bestowed in the AIMS annual convention to management educators and professionals for achieving a high level of distinction in their respective disciplines. And AIMS also conducts entrance examination for the admission into MBA program or BCDM programs in the country uh, while conducting ATMA, AIMS test for management admissions. AIMS also provides financial assistance to member institutions for various programs. And AIMS also has a very, very prestigious journal, which is uh, also part of UGC care list, that is AIMS Journal of Management. And AIMS also promotes research while gra providing grants to the select scholars and faculty. AIMS and international networks also there, AIMS works in collaboration with a large number of management schools, networks in the world, particularly mentioned may be made in the respect of ACBSP, MDSA, and ESMD, European Foundation for Management Development. Uh, friends, apart from that, the online FDPs and webinars have started. The AIMS is the first professional body started conducting webinars, FDPs, case writing workshops, ever since the outbreak of COVID-19. There are two more series of the online sessions are being organized. That is uh, inspiring young leaders and knowledge sharing sessions are being organized from the current academic year under the leadership of Professor Ramaswamy Nandagopal. Uh, he is currently the president of AIMS. Friends, AIMS has been nurturing various institutions and it is guided steered by the president, uh, regional vice presidents, treasurer, and all the illustrious professionals you name, you can find the top class who is who on the executive board. I'm really very happy to be part of this AIMS. And today, before we request our professor, Ravi Kumar Jain, I wish to introduce him with a very, very few you know, observations because it's not a matter to read, but it is the fact. Professor Ravi Kumar Jain, the founder director of uh, Symbios Institute of Management, Hyderabad. And he has been an institution builder and one of the multi-skilled professionals and one of the management thought leaders. And he is very active in almost all the professional bodies and active professional in sharing the knowledge and mostly the research work. And I'm happy to have Professor Ravi Jain with us today. And uh, he is the person who has actually developed this model, 4E concept. 4Es, that 4Es stands for what and how that can be you know, inducted uh, into the minds of the young students and young teachers who are going to teach the management students in the country. I'm really very happy and excited. While I listened to him for the first time, the model he has developed. In fact, I was telling experiential learning, experimental learning and participative learning. But he could give me additional two more years, you know, added very, very, uh, very productive thought. I'm really very grateful to Professor Ravi Kumar Jain, uh, a close friend of me. Uh, what else I can talk about him? Now I request, Professor Ravi Kumar Jain, uh, the floor is open to you. And before that, friends, the program is live on YouTube. And those who are there, not only here in the Zoom, but uh, who are there on the YouTube also provided the link for your feedback and uh, registration so that you will be given certificates. The participation certificate will be given based on your attendance. And also you are free to ask your questions you know, while texting. Once the presentation is done, once Ravi shared his uh, you know, vision, I think the floor is open for discussion also. Now, over to Professor Ravi Kumar Jain. Ravi ji, over to you. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Rao. Uh, you have always been very generous with your words and uh, you have a special skill of uh, introducing people, uh, making them happy. Uh, thanks for those wonderful words. At the outset, let me 
thank as well as congratulate aims for inviting me for today's session in the lecture series or the young leaders series uh, under the leadership of uh, new president uh, professor nandu gopal the entire team of aims have been struggling or i would say making strides all through in achieving the objective as prasad rao said of bridging the divide between practice and theory or bring or encourage more research engage with government and corporate and so on and so forth so as a part of that series as a part of those activities i think this series do serve a purpose of bringing us together in sharing our thoughts sharing our ideas and experiments that we all as teachers keep doing with our students as institution builder we keep doing at our institutions to bring more value onto the table for management education at large and also to the institution that you are working today's session is one such session where i would prefer to share my experiences and experiments that i started way back in 2006-7 uh i was heavily influenced by professor david garvin of uh, harvard business school uh, whether it is case method teaching or uh, in fact questioning the very idea of management education and where the management education is heading and where we should be taking it uh, forward and how do we contribute in that journey 15 16 years into this journey a few thoughts few experiments few successes few failures gave me a perspective on what perhaps should be done to ensure that we drive the change not just at the teaching method level but at the very idea of business school or the very orientation of the program called mba or how the curriculum is designed and to how it is delivered and uh, how it how the business leaders of tomorrow are nurtured so in this journey i have gone through i have i've used a few uh, experiments and a few initiatives which gave me some understanding or i would say confidence that yes if we apply some of these aspects in our classroom with our students at our administration with our people in our curriculum design in our way of engaging with the corporate and in our way of looking at the impact of management education on the larger globe itself you know when we are producing global citizens so it all started from a few thoughts normally i don't use ppts and all but this morning dr rao was somehow insisting so i thought i uh, let me put a couple of slides together uh, so that i can point by point i can uh, you know try to reach out to you and see uh, i can uh, convey the point the very first idea I and mean, before i go into it i said i am influenced by garvin and professor shrikant data i want to show you a small clip of a 12 13 minutes video and from there we'll uh, kick start our uh, discussion and i presume that in the audience we have professors and institution leaders so i would be happy if you can throw challenge at me or perhaps ask questions and be more interactive so that this can be more of a conversation rather than a presentation it is by no standards it is a it is a it is not a presentation at all it will be more of a conversation from my end but let it not be one sided so i'll be happy if you if i if we, if we have pleasure of seeing you on the cameras on the screens and uh, also we'll be happy if you can uh, share some feedback or questions or your thoughts on it. okay so let me uh, prasad rao garu can i share this screen i yeah have... you can you can 
So first, the, the overarching topic. We, we really approach the interview. Is this voice clear? Is that what I'm saying? Yeah, it's clear. The single question. First, the, the overarching. Okay, let me give you the background. The research that Professor Garvin and Professor Srikant Data took up way back in 2006, incidentally, that is the year when uh, I also got, I mean, a year before that we got trained by uh, Professor Garvin uh, on the Harvard case methods. Uh, and, you know, that's where the influence, his influence on us started. So the, the basis of this uh, uh, research was, uh, where is this, this MBA as a program is going or where is it heading, management education is heading. And can we get feedback from the stakeholders as to what we are, I mean, in terms of value add, what is that we are bringing onto the table? And they went to the corporates seeking questions, I mean, asking questions, seeking their feedback. And what Garvin is saying now for the next one, one and a half minutes or two minutes uh, between Srikant Datar and uh, David Garvin, uh, please pay attention. That's with the genesis of whatever framework I'm going to talk about. We, we really approach the interviews with both the deans and the executives with a single question. What today is the value added of the MBA degree? So it was a very open-ended poll. Really, we didn't have priors. And our expectation based on Harvard was that things were going reasonably well. And then we heard this rising chorus of concerns. And the concerns really fell in two broad buckets. So one was this concern that you're not teaching more than knowledge. It's very much an academic perspective. And we borrowed from West Point a trilogy of knowing, doing, and being. That every professional school should have some material in each one of those buckets. Things that you need to know, knowledge, like the four pieces mm -hmm. of market, the five forces of strategy. Things you need to be able to do okay. or skills, like how to conduct a performance review or conduct a negotiation. And then being a sense of professional identity and responsibility. And then the second big bucket was a set of more specific, concrete arenas in which people felt we could do much more. A global mindset, creative, innovative thinking, organizational realities, where people felt MBAs were coming out with a limited and often distorted view of the way the world actually works. And I think uh, if one, as we began then sort of putting all these pieces together, what you very quickly realize is that management isn't an individual activity. It's unlike a relationship between a doctor and a lawyer or, or and their clients or an architect or an accountant. You know, managers rely on well, designing organizations, working with people around them in order to have a big impact. And that's why society wants uh, us to form companies, and create the jobs and the economic well-being that results. So without being, without this notion that you actually have to have self-awareness, you have to have an impact on others, you have to think about the roles and responsibilities, nothing will get done. So that gets us to the doing part. And if nothing gets done, then all the knowledge we're providing is really not, a, not having the kind of impact we would want managers to have. And so as we looked at that West Point model and then started talking about knowing, doing, and being, uh, we realized very quickly that how important it is to have these three things together. Can you tell me a little bit about the two cultures problem? Maybe we'll come back to that when we talk a little bit about faculty. I think it's a, it, it, it was a very... So if you look at here in this conversation, uh, David Garvin and uh, Professor Srikant Datar is the current Dean of Harvard Business School. They are contemplating on what is the value add that MBA program brings onto the table. And they, they realize that uh, there are gaps. And interestingly, even in Indian context, we have been debating about this relevance of MBA program for decades altogether, saying that there is a dichotomy, there is a difference, there is an alley between theory and practice. What has been practiced is never you know, uh, taught, or what is taught is irrelevant or passe or you know, 
uh, it has uh, gone beyond its uh, useful life uh, and uh, it doesn't find any relevance in the in the changing context now with rapidly changing context this alley is further deepening so where do we go from here means this renders the mba program redundant perhaps and this was the question at harvard business school level a decade and a half ago and we are now looking at a society business context which is more global in nature more integrated in nature more interdependent in nature is changing by the day the contexts are changing the scenarios are changing the scales are different so how do you fathom that and bring that into the industry just saying that bringing some practitioners into classroom having guest lectures and all will that be will that be a, a true bringing theory and practice together not necessarily maybe it's an initial step maybe it's just opening of the door but that's not where it uh, uh, should be lying where unfortunately in our context right now uh, we see that and this divide between theory and practice so to say the, the proverbial divide has been you know uh, deepening and deepening and further deepening second interesting aspect is with the changing context especially when we are looking at everything from the perspective of sustainability there are predictions that the world or this earth will not last for next 40 years in terms of its uh, fertility so we will not be able to grow our uh, food so if you if you can't grow your food you are staring at a survival crisis right and suddenly they started blaming business schools who produced ruthless competitors for a century almost so are we looking at business schools as in fact culprits of creating these unbridled consumers unbridled exploitators of the nature of the environment of the people without any purpose they are chasing the so called kpi or the bottom line and taking us to the bottom of the pit and uh, bringing us to the uh, stage where survival crisis we are staring at a survival crisis now these are the allegations often put on business schools at global level we have trained or we are training ruthless competitors here is a context for us so i thought i mean this was in 2014 when i got a opportunity to build a campus from scratch from zero from ground uh, grounds up a greenfield project in uh, hyderabad uh, thanks to simbasis for uh, giving me that opportunity at that time we said how do we differentiate our business school in what way we can start at least make a humble beginning at least in our thought process in our conception itself can we be different and we have written our vision statement at that time ki we want to nurture socially conscious business leaders of tomorrow and gave three e's which are going to be our driving force in the entire pedagogical design that means what we teach and how we teach will be driven by these three e's and as we kept on in you know experimenting and working on these three e's the fourth e is also added which is the significant significantly big e or most important we call environment so i will come to the fourth part in fact i would want to give you the background of where do we come from so the vision of a business school of today should be to produce or nurture more of inclusive business leaders let me share the screen uh, one slide of my screen and see if that makes sense okay is the screen visible okay great yes. so here we say that management education that there is a need to pivot there is a need to shift our orientation from generating or nurturing or bringing out ruthless competitors we need to be we need to be producing leaders or business uh, i would say uh, leaders of tomorrow who are purpose driven and socially conscious so this pivot is necessary for the survival of the globe for building more sustainable businesses and also to ensure that business schools remain 
purposeful by contributing to the society by giving a responsible talent pool. So we said, and also develop contextually relevant new constructs through action research. Now again, business schools have been following this mad rush of empirical data-driven or uh, scientific structured approach of research or structured research methods. No doubt it is a good way to do or conduct a research, but business management doesn't is not amenable to only that. There are so many other things which are more contextual, which are more subjective, where a lot of other methods are bulldozed by the so-called structured or empirical approach. We need to accommodate them also. And the most important thing which recently came on in the last uh, a decade or so is the action research part. So management education or business schools should pivot in terms of two important aspects as to what they are bringing out, what they are contributing to the society in terms of talent pool and what they're contributing in terms of thought leadership, in terms of new thoughts and new constructs. Because almost all the old constructs of the old economy, which was rooted in industry 1.0 and 2.0 are almost uh, redundant now, and they are not able to give uh, any solid reference point to solve problems of today and perhaps the future. So we have to move on from ruthless competitors, from generating ruthless competitors to reasonable collaborators. We need to move on from unbridled exploitation to conservative deployment of resources and the restoration of resources for a simple reason that the resources used, including the natural resources, are resources of the society and they are not private resources. And the third is we have to move on from, in, from promoting irresponsible consumerism to conscious or rather conservative consumption in whatever we use. In fact, very interestingly, in the Indian ethos, in the Indian way of life, conservatism or being conscious as was ingrained in the culture itself, whether it is use of water or any natural resources, we would address that as God or goddess and say, we need to respect it. We need to ensure that we keep it neat and clean. We have to ensure that it is protected. It is preserved. Now from preservation to we have actually got into exploitation and then as an afterthought as restoration or reparation. So I call it moving from reparation to preparation, from exploitation to restoration. And the new KPIs for management education should be four Ps. The four Ps are the purpose. What is the purpose of the business? So at the business management or business education itself, the students should be or the learners should be conditioned in terms of when they are getting into a business or when they're starting a business or when they work for anybody else's business, the very idea, very purpose of the business has to be established. What is that they are contributing to the society? What is that they are contributing to the sustainability of the society, sustainability of the globe and economic well-being, not economic growth alone. The economic growth and welfare and well-being should be married together. So economic well-being is something has to be the very purpose. So it should be purpose driven. Then the second focus should be on the planet. That means every decision you take, every from the very model of the business to the operating model, the machinery, the technology, the processes, the process design, everything, we should ensure that planet is taken into consideration, environment is taken into consideration, and impact of those decisions on the planet has to be, we have to orient them. The second P would be that our focus on, or the, the say orientation should be on planet, then on people. You have to work with people as Shikan Datar in his talk just now that I've shown, he insists or you know talks about, when you're talking about organization or manager, he's not working alone or the business is not just one man uh, show. He is to work with the entire ecosystem where people are a significant part. And more so in a digital environment or a knowledge era, people are all the more important. 
So you have to work with people, take them along, look at their welfare. And we have to, I mean, we keep uh, saying, in fact, in our uh, orientation classes and all, I keep saying that as a good leader, you have to ensure that you plan for well-being of 24 hours of your people, 24 hours of their life. And they will give you 10 or 12 effective hours of their life every day for the business and the growth of the business and the progress of the business. And if these three things are taken care, profits would be eventually achieved. So profit deliberately is put at the end as a fourth P. Whereas in the old school, where all our management education, we have been focusing on only the, the profit that is only that so-called big P called bottom line. Profit and profit and profit and profit using various terms like wealth creation, wealth management, uh, you know, and so on, uh, stakeholders' wealth, and so on and so forth. So here, from the very orientation of your program, the program orientation should be on these four P's of purpose-driven, planet-conscious, people, uh, you know, uh, accommodating people or taking people along, and then uh, focus on profit or generate profits. And I strongly believe that all these things are rooted in the Indian ethos of uh, the, the way we had our businesses and the way uh, we had our communities, uh, uh, what you call, woven around uh, uh, the businesses uh, long ago for, for centuries. And we were very prosperous society uh, before uh, we got into, uh, I must say, uh, a, a, a phase of losing ourselves over a thousand years uh, due to invasions and you know foreign rules and so on and so forth. So here is the time for us to revisit, bring it again or revive it and say, hey, profits will happen if you take care of what is the purpose of your business and you play along with or stay harmonious with your planet and take uh, people along with you and uh, you will be prof profitable and sustainably profitable. Then these four Ps, once the program is oriented around these four Ps, it should be translated into the curriculum design itself. If you look at the logical uh, you know, flow here, you say when a program has a certain orientation, your curriculum will be designed to accommodate or to reflect that orientation. Now, when we are shifting the program orientation, we cannot stop there, otherwise it won't be effective. It should translate into your curriculum. Now, I have developed a framework which we impl implemented successfully at Symbiosis Hyderabad is GSTWE framework. This framework has five components and each course would cite each of these components in the overall learning outcomes. Governance, sustainability, technology, environment, and ethics. What does that mean? Says that your curriculum, suppose you, if you're talking about a marketing management program or a marketing management coursework, in that what are the areas of governance whereby your responsibility to the stakeholders is pronounced? And how do you translate that into curriculum? So in the, in the curriculum or in the course, uh, or the, uh, uh, what do you call the, the course handout of say marketing management course, the governance element, whatever topic is amenable or wherever the aspect of governance is relevant, that aspect need to be incorporated in that particular topic by way of either role play, by way of uh, either uh, a case study or a story or a visit to market or bringing in the expert in that area, what are the challenges of governance? Where are the pitfalls in this area? Like, you know, for example, whether it is product design or selling of a product to uh, people, whether you sell somehow or it is governed by certain principles. When you are reporting uh, to your, uh, you know, company or when you are designing a product, when you are marketing the research guys, give you some input on you know product design how do you you know uh, report it how do you uh, uh, what do you call uh, communicate to the uh, stakeholders is there a governance mechanism there so wherever it is possible that has to be mapped and that should be part of your curriculum same is about the sustainability part in that wherever the concept of sustainability is relevant it should be incorporated in that topic by way of any of these toolkits that i talked about 
Then comes technology. Whatever is the technology latest and relevant today for that course need to be delivered in that particular course. And obviously environmental impact of those decisions or those concepts when you are making a decision uh, in say marketing or finance or HR in any of the coursework, or any of the stream, the relevance or the impact on environment should also be highlighted within the course. So when you develop a course structure or your course handout, all these five components should be inculcated or you know, uh, you know, implemented in that or should be reflected in that so that the faculty, when they deliver a course, they deliver all these five aspects of that particular course. And ethics, obviously, for every managerial topic or management topic, the ethical framework need to be emphasized, even at the cost of repetition. Why? Because we have moved much away from the ethical you know, fabric with which society used to operate. And we, we have come to a stage where we are OK with you know, uh, uh, any kind of uh, unethical practice, saying that as long as you make profits, everything is fair. Perhaps to bring that back, to bring people from that particular you know, toxic orientation back to the roots, we may have to implement these ethical aspects in every course, even at the cost of repetition. And uh, this framework, so four piece orientation at the program level and the GST framework at the curriculum level helps us in taking it into the program, what we want or what we call a sustainable or a purpose driven uh, curriculum and uh, program, which will help us in nurturing responsible business managers. So then comes the fourth, uh, third aspect, that is okay, you have got the program orientation right. You have got the curriculum design also right. Now, how do I deliver that curriculum to be able to deliver these things or to be able to take these things into the classroom? For that, we thought there must be a, a framework, uh, there must be a model which will help us in consistently achieve our four Ps and comply with GSTWE so that we achieve our uh, purpose. So there, these four Ps were, four E's were identified. Now these four E's again are not new, so to say, but they are all scattered in terms of our practices and uh, uh, ideas and thoughts being shared in the, in the uh, management, uh, I would say circles, or in fact, uh, the, the institution uh, um, uh, academic administrative circles, he, how do we do it? So many of us now started talking about experiential learning in the last few years. This term has become almost, uh, I mean, it's been used and overused and abused to some extent, where sometimes we just use the word for the fancy of it. But how do we achieve it is something which is key. And that's where the pedagogical design or pedagogical innovation comes into the picture. So all four Ps have to be taken care to be able to consistently get the outcome because all four E's are interlinked. So these four E's, let me just take you to uh, take you through a quick uh, uh, intro of what this means. The four E's framework, the first E and most significant E or most visible E is the experiential learning. Means the way program is imparted, the way concepts are delivered. And there has been a, I would say consensus or a now a common thinking that the old method of chalk and talk perhaps is not sufficient. Where a good teacher may be able to deliver or transfer the knowledge successfully, but that is not sufficient. Second, with the technology and a lot of content at the disposal of the student, Delivery of knowledge is not that of a great value add. <clears throat> then what do we do? So we have to think creatively as teachers and ad, as uh, institution administrators in what way we can engage the students so that we deliver or we put them through immersive learning where they deep dive into the very process of learning and they are engaged in the, those modules for each of the course. So if there are 24, 30 courses that we are delivering over a two year program, 
of a, a MBA or a short module program of say three months, experiential learning where you, you engage people into an activity and then comprehend, reflect upon what has happened and you know, kind of list down the learnings and based on those learnings, can we try and either map the concepts or conceptualize a new construct? Because again, there is no universality or agelessness of the concepts which are which we teach or which we bring into the classroom through the uh, textbooks. So the typical experiential learning uh, uh, you know, model would be put them into the action, put them into the activity, let them be in charge of the activity. Then there should be a guided reflection mode. Means you just leave them, do the activity, and then you forget it and move on to the next one. Perhaps we are missing out the point. The point here is when you are putting them through an activity, when you are putting them through a, a, a particular uh, action sequence or a particular uh, uh, assignment where they have to engage and do it. The next logical step would be debriefing and reflections, whereby we have to, by in a structured way, in a, in a systematic way, we have to ensure that reflections and feedbacks are done and noted down. And these reflections, based on these in reflections and inputs and observations, active observations, then go and see whether we can map to an existing construct, whether it is an Indian construct or an Eastern management construct or a Western management construct, whatever theoretical construct that we have at our disposal, can that be mapped? There is no need to force fit it. If it cannot be mapped as it is, then can we develop a new model or can we look at or can we be try and conceptualize this as a this observation as a new model or a new construct and do we stop there no that will be work incomplete if we stop there the next logical step would be to ensure that this new hypothesis or the new construct developed should be taken forward and experimented applied in new scenarios applied in new context applied in a new situation and then say whether it gives you the desirable results or desired results, or whether it has any consistency of what is observed vis-a-vis -vis what outcome you get in a change of scenario. Now that experimentation will help in theory building again. So you are talking about practice, immersive learning means a practice where you are exposing your students, your learners into doing things and then making them reflect upon their or experiences and observations, conceptualizing them, and then making them experiment or apply them in a new scenario, new context. Now, that is the full cycle of experiential learning. Many a times what happens is we stop at the very first uh, stage and leave it, the other three stages, uh, to the chance. So some students who are active and who are uh, entrepreneurial in their nature, they may come to you, they may uh, approach the faculty and take to the next level or the next level, depending on uh, the faculty orientation towards this whole experiential learning and uh, the faculty's understanding of this experiential learning. For example, let me uh, give you, uh, say for example, this conflict management. Now, we put them in typical experiential learning framework or uh, experiential learning um, module, we put students in typical groups and give them a task and give them a learning uh, uh, audible point and say, okay, you come back with these observations. So in, a, in the process of uh, working on a topic, they are supposed to debate and discuss and arrive at a consensus. So there we, in the second stage after the task is over, in the debriefing stage, we call them, okay, what are the nuances of negotiation that you have observed while doing it? whether you negotiated or your colleagues in the group negotiated and what was the basis and how was the negotiation or how was the discussion uh, you know, led. Second, the, the techniques of persuasion different members of the group have used in, uh, in arriving at consensus and who took the lead and how he or she took the lead in building that consensus. Now these three, four, five components are typical aspects of how do you handle conflicts? Now we say, okay, now these things we have observed one, two, three, four, five observations. Now this fits into a, a, a context, which was some 20 years ago or 30 years ago, 40 years ago, 
somebody uh, observing Hawthorne experiments has given us. Okay, now with this construct, is it applicable to a, a situation where you have multi-generation diverse work group working in a distributed teams across the globe, you know, without any, you know, restriction on uh, geographical boundaries. Now, can this construct work in that situation? Observe and come back with the model, but the concept need to be understood or retweaked or, you know, uh, 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 reworked upon. And then, you know, you take it forward for the theory building. Now, this cycle must be completed. And this is something which we have done at our uh, place, whether it is uh, HROB or whether it is uh, finance and investment for that matter. In fact, we have created something called a live screen-based teaching model of teaching derivatives. Now, one of the scariest subjects in finance, I'm sure professors in finance would watch with what I'm saying, is a very tough uh, subject to teach in a classroom. Now, without engaging them into live screen-based trading in commodities and uh, you know uh, some of the uh, using some of the hedging tools and all, it will be very difficult to ingrain or to 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 uh, drive the point home. So, one of our faculty member actually was trained and also uh, he has developed this model of leading the entire course on the live screen of commodities. So whether it is a, you am implementing a straddle strategy or a butterfly strategy or a strangle strategy, he would actually give them this uh, uh, in, a, in a simulated environment where you use something called paper trading model. And after that transaction is done, he would actually you know, lead them through the whole process of what they did, how they did, how they led the decision making, what were the parameters of decision making, why they failed and why they succeeded. By when I say failed and succeeded, whether they ended up making profits or they ended up losing money. And second stage in this method of learning was, in fact, to work with real money. Now, that has given a fantastic edge to the students who have gone through this process of learning. So, in some cases, they say the so called straddle model or straddle strategy never gave us return because almost every participant in the, uh, you know, if everybody in the game follows the same strategy, uh, it, it will be self defeating. Okay, so that was a fantastic observation. And in fact, uh, if you draw, you know, if you, if you uh, know the story of LTCM, which is a big debacle, the LTCM as a company was floated by. The, uh, the the professors who have given us who have given the world this uh, option pricing model so based on the option pricing model they have created a huge corporation dealing with billions and billions of uh, uh, asset uh, you know under their management now when they started using this strategy initially they were actually super successful in making great money but as and when more and more people started subscribing to their uh, uh, tool and uh, getting their money for management with this company, the tool itself became self-defeating. And if you go back and Google the story of LTCM debacle, it failed overnight. When I say over weeks, in a few weeks, it, 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 it crumbled down, uh, losing billions and billions of dollars of the investors. They, and when they probed into the result, they said the strategy being used for more than 60 or 70 percent of the fund being managed was self-defeating. Right, so these kind of observations can come only when you put the uh, students or the learners into that kind of a situation, and then you can draw the the parallels from the history or from the current practice and so on. Now, the second aspect is uh, experimental approach. Now, we all know typical experimental approach is uh, to have a structured and systematic uh, 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 what do you call uh, way of approaching a problem. Now here, in the experiential learning, this third phase, when we are saying your observations are conceptualized and where do we go from here? Exposing the students to newer situations, sometimes even fictitious situations. <coughs> sometimes giving them imaginary situations and say, okay, let us see if this works in a scenario like this or draw parallels or using your own experience as a faculty member, uh, draw parallels 
of uh, a given practice in a specific uh, uh, context of a business and say, okay, now whether this will apply there, how do you solve a problem? How do you identify a problem there? And how do you conceptualize the, or, uh, you know, uh, uh, what do you call dissect the problem so that you can bring in the solution. Now, when you are approaching a solution in a typical experimental approach, the students would be encouraged to think <coughs> in a, I would say, integrated uh, manner where all the components or all the players in the decision making scenario are integrated. All the functional aspects are integrated. When you say integrated thinking, you are bringing in the holistic thinking of total impact that your solution to a given problem brings in to the company in terms of either increasing profit or uh, increasing satisfaction, customer satisfaction, or a better uh, improvisation in reaching out to customers or reducing your cost of delivery and so on and so forth. And also ensuring that they don't think in those silos and think by conforming to the uh, uh, standard constructs. They have to be disruptive in their thinking. When I say disruptive, disruption for development. Next, Kelikya. So when we keep talking about best practices and all, we must orient them to next practices. Now, when I say next practices, this is where the third component or the third E of uh, my framework comes in. Now that is entrepreneurial spirit. What do you mean by entrepreneurial spirit? A typical, uh, if I have to you know, put it in simple terms, an entrepreneur is somebody who would question the status quo and who brings in that optimism and opportunism. The one who believes in better possibilities and better future. He say, Aisa nahi, vaisa ho sakta hai. There is some way better than what we are doing. Now, this is the crux of a typical entrepreneurial spirit. And there you also have entrepreneurial, uh, entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial spirit, I would say, captures the very essence of uh, insatiable curiosity of asking more, trying to learn more, trying to deep dive more into whatever they are doing. They are self-driven doers and open for collaboration. And ensure that when we are, when we are uh, nurturing our uh, students in terms of uh, developing their entrepreneurial spirit, we are helping them in two important ways. One is we are trying to help them in conquering the fear of failure, which is the major, major impediment in success, whether you are an entrepreneur or whether you are working for your business as an entrepreneur or you're working for some other's business. But if you have this entrepreneurial approach, you will always have solutions to a problem. You will not hesitate in picking up the new challenge and say, hey, let me do it. Even if it's at the cost of you know a failure, I don't mind. Let me take the charge. Let me you know uh, uh, take the plunge and see if things can work, if I can make things happen. Now, to overcome this fear of failure is the single most outcome that I would personally desire that this entrepreneurial spirit or cultivating this entrepreneurial spirit or the third E of my framework is all about. And another important aspect is to be able to develop high tolerance for ambiguity. World is ambiguous, future is ambiguous, and the rapid change that we are in right now, every day things are changing, the business scenarios and contexts are changing, people are changing, and technologies are rapidly changing. The ambiguity of what next is always very high. So unless you develop the tolerance for ambiguity, you won't be in a position to be able to make bold decisions, quick decisions, or you no, know, you won't be able to prevent yourself from getting overwhelmed of, of, of from a new situation or new scenario that you confront. So two outcomes would be overcoming the fear of failure and uh, high tolerance for ambiguity. The rest all things are more natural. So when you put them through certain scenarios of experimentation in the second E, this entrepreneurial spirit, certain aspects of optimism, certain aspect of questioning the status quo can be cultivated. Sometimes some people by nature are not oriented to some of these aspects. Some of them are by nature not very optimistic or they are pessimistic. 
they see problem in every solution or they see problems everywhere so by putting them into this uh, you know the the second e that is experimental approach you are trying to cultivate this entrepreneurial spirit now this is a proper i would say my program outcome where the spirit of uh, i mean the, the fear of failure is overcome you have a set of students or a set of future managers who are bold who are there to go out and take challenges not reckless risk but calculated risk and also those who have high tolerance for ambiguity where they don't get overwhelmed with any new scenario that confronts them obviously uh, self driven and doers and being open for collaboration and all the skills that you help them hone by putting them into different unknown scenarios different strange problem statements and exposing them to some real life uh, uh, you know environment while they are studying and the fourth e i must say is a more significant and more important e that we all have to at the curricular level at the very spirit level at the program level and with the at the vision level we have to incorporate of being environmentally conscious friends i am sure you will all agree with me that we are losing on the environment side we are playing big uh, mischief with the nature for centuries together now they say nature only need one hour to settle the score we don't want nature to get that furious and decide to settle the score with us in an hour with a with a natural calamity and all that things that we are looking at whether it is global warming or whatever whether somebody says or not we have been trained in that earlier so we have to revive that practice it is still there in the very cultural fabric of uh, indian uh, i would say lifestyle or the indian way of living now that has to be brought in into the classroom into the curriculum and into the very pedagogy that we uh, develop now for example as a uh, as a institutional administrator you can certainly say okay we will use less paper or we'll go paperless in certain aspects now this is our reflection of being little more environmentally conscious for example you use technology for evaluations and examinations so what we did was we started with an experiment of using gamification of internal assessments so a lot of tools like kahoot.com and you know quizzes and all that uh, i mean there are half a dozen uh, tools that we explored and we started using in different subjects differently and including simulations and some games and all that to ensure that the evaluations are done in a virtual environment or in a environment which is technical technology enabled and not paper driven or not paper and pen now that gave us good results where uh, i must say I mean, if, if you ask me the quantum and all more than 70% of the paper and stationery which was otherwise consumed we could save on that the next logical step for us which we uh, i moved on uh, before we could implement that is actually using digital pads for examination now there are fantastic technologies available where you can actually have ai based monitored examination on uh, digital pads which are robust enough there are vendors there are uh, universities which are already using it if i may name uh, manipal university at uh, bangalore and even at manipal uses this digital pad as a as a you know um, uh, as a as an initiative to have a paperless examination the entire uh load not just paper but the entire uh, department of examination uh, all the work which was normally done as a routine work is completely uh, taken off their uh, desk and they are the people are able to do more and better and in different directions uh, than you know uh, uh, get stuck in uh, routine aspects now we at my current place also trying to explore on using those digital pads so what i mean to say is this is one a way of communicating saying that hey there are ways if we think we can achieve uh, you know a, a more harmony with the environment and do the same things in in fact if not better do the same things get the same results without being you know uh, uh, damaging to the environment and this has to be cultivated in the learners mindset Uh, that every decision that they take whether it is a promoting a product or uh, uh, you know having say employee assessment 
or uh, making a making a uh, investment uh, we have to ensure that the environment is kept as a centerpiece of their decision making and they should be conscious when they are making a decision they should be able to think through what is the impact of this decision on the environment in the short run and in the long run for example a typical production technology so if i'm using uh, okay there was a let me let me share this so there was a interesting debate on uh, how green is the green in one of the seminars so somewhere i'm not a technical person but i i made a very naive question saying that can we look at the entire supply chain of the energy right source of energy and the way energy is uh, consumed or stored and consumed produced stored and consumed and see where the pollution or where the environmental damage is the maximum and are we containing it now in the battery technology they said yeah yeah lithium ion battery and you know the, the evs and all are but how green are they you are only moving the fossil fuel uh, and the pollution they bring in the carbon footprints they bring in from one stage that is the consumption level to the production level now look at the uh, extraction or the you know the way lithium is extracted what kind of damage is inflicted there so you have only moved the damage from one part of or one point of the supply chain to the other point you have not essentially reduced it you might have reduced it incrementally for the kind of halla huwala that we have you know created around it so can we think creatively can we look at the end to end when i say environmental consciousness i would want my students and my learners to be conscious about the entire spectrum of things ki okay when i'm making a decision what is visible to me in terms of my environmental footprints vis a vis the entire spectrum of activities now am i moving the damage from here to there right it is like keeping my house clean by throwing the dirt on the road or somebody uh, you know uh, picking up the garbage from the road and dumping it somewhere so somewhere you are not disposing it you are dumping it you are only changing the place now can we think of how do we reduce that production of uh, you know or, or reduce our environmental footprints or have more greener footprints and be more creative now management graduates are supposed to be more creative or more disruptive in their thinking more unconventional in their thinking by way of experimental approach and experiential learning you are already cultivating that now the whole idea of whether these things reflect in their environmental consciousness is something which we have to keep uh, uh, evaluating testing and you know having uh, more deliberations and discussions so different uh, i would say pedagogical tools can be used now whatever portfolio of toolkit that we have whether it is uh, you know typical conventional uh, lecture method or taking them taking them to the field like for example when we were teaching uh, 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 entrepreneurship and in fact there is something called frugal innovation we have taken them uh, all the uh, participants in that particular course uh, to hinterlands for 3 days and we called it as shodh yatra now shodh yatra was uh, uh, in association with an ngo which works with the farmers in agri innovation so what kind of innovations coming from the hinterlands unexpected you know areas unexpected uh, uh, what do you call uh, labs of life uh uh you know and uh, that was a fantastic experiment and students loved it i mean the kind of products they bring brought uh, you know to the fore and thereafter they have conducted a small uh, uh exhibition of those uh, innovations uh, on our campus so likewise we can go on doing that like for example when one of our faculty members was teaching uh, rural marketing he taught 60% of the course actually taking them to rural market and having conversation with the consumption pattern the consumption timing the quantum and the very decision making the consumption decision all that in the very hinterlands or very you know uh, 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 rural markets to try to understand uh, how they choose a product what prompts them to you know uh, consume uh, what they consume and how much they consume and what is the pattern of their consumption and so on so likewise we can go on and on i can i mean you know i can narrate a lot of stories about uh, these initiatives and these creative uh, pedagogical practices or tools that uh, our faculty have used or we have developed as a part of practice uh, so that every faculty brings in uh, uh, 
a set of creative interventions that they want to do in their domain. All marketing professors would bring along set of tools and techniques and interventions what they want to do to align with these four Ps. And believe me, friends, this has been a huge experiment and a great success we have got in every aspect. And in fact, some of the programs, some of the courses, uh, we have 100% experiential learning now, whether it is uh, investment class or whether it is rural marketing class or whether it is uh, 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 what you call uh, team building or your uh, conflict management class. So these are all, uh, you know, experiential in nature. So I think uh, these four elements, if properly harnessed and structured at individual level as professors and teachers, and if this can be formalized more at institution level, I'm sure we'll be able to deliver what we are supposed to deliver in terms of a changed or a more, more rigorous, more impactful learning, more purposeful learning to our learners. Let me pause here and uh, check with the audience uh, if they are there and uh, want to uh, share a few thoughts and their own experiences. Prasad Rao Garu, can we yeah. Can have... Yeah, actually, you can, you can wind up almost uh, the time is up. Okay, great. We, oh. yeah, you can conclude. One more right. question also is there. Okay. From Professor Dev Prasad Chetopajai. Okay, great. So, I mean, uh, uh, just to sum up, or just to, I would say, in, uh, in, in one line, all these four E's are to be aligned to the GSTE framework and that to be aligned with four P's. To ensure that our teaching, learning and assessment are impactful and uh, I would say uh, will help us in uh, nurturing purposeful, socially conscious, purpose-driven business managers of tomorrow. And that is the very purpose of uh, any business school. I would say that is the moral responsibility of any business school. And in fact, this morning, I got an interesting message from uh, some of these WhatsApp groups where they say the new KPIs now is not the key performance indicators, but it is about keep your people interested, keep your people informed, keep your people involved, and keep your people inspired. So I think we should develop managers and leaders of tomorrow with that spirit. Thank you so much. Ultimate. Ultimate. Yeah, Raviji, before, uh, you know, concluding, I have a question from one of the participants, Professor Deva Prasad Chetopajaji. He is asking, should the management education include the actionable research? What, what, does, what does he mean by actionable return there? Uh, Dev Prasad ji, please unmute and you may pause your review. So first of all, sir, thank you so much for the excellent presentation. Uh, my query in all humility was, for example, in HR, which incidentally happens to be my area in training and development. For example, when I'm teaching my students, would it benefit if I actually encourage the students to do training need analysis, to do training design? to actually deliver the training and finally to evaluate the impact of training amongst peers. That is what I meant by actual research in my query, sir. Absolutely, absolutely, Dr. Deva Prasad. Uh, you know, uh, I can share an example here. We have uh, these uh, learning groups yes. in that the lead uh, for each functional area is identified. And in okay. fact, this design of training, delivery, and taking the feedback. And this would be rotated among the students in each of the topics. So there are 10 topics in a given course. Each of them actually design one training program and actually deliver it under the able leadership of the faculty concerned. Now, oh. faculty will help them in how do they how do they design it, how do they take the reflections and you know feedback and you know uh, uh, kind of uh, get the overall experience of doing it. So when they go back to their uh, you know in the corporate scenario they'll be able to do it because this is a familiar situation for them. They have done it earlier. Yeah. Thank you Thank so you. much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ravi. You are always performing beyond the expectations. You said only four years framework. It is your copyright, of course. We are very happy. But you could deliver beyond the expectations, like, you know, 
program orientation then program curriculum development and pedagogical pedagogical framework a fantastic session as you were always very committed and work with a lot of conviction and commitment that is the hallmark of professor ravi kumar jain i thank the secretariat aims for uh, providing all the support that is required and also thank uh, the president of aims professor ramaswami nandagopal the director stg group of institutions uh, pollachi tamil nadu and all the members include board members who are present professor durga prasad is there and senior professors faculty members and research scholars also there i'm really very happy to see all my former colleagues friends academic you know professionals across the country uh, thank prasad, you professor ravi yes is one more prasad i am also there hmm. nanda ji yeah 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 please i am also there thank you very much prasad and thank you ravi i think it was an excellent presentation i was listening to you for the past one hour and really it is a you gave me great insight to the faculty members and the younger generation of teachers thank you ravi for joining with us today and also prasad rao taking the session beautifully as your own style and thank you very much you can conclude prasad thank you, thank you. Thank you. i thank all the, the participants ravi ji before you yeah i thank all the participants and my colleagues friends across the country thank you so much and looking forward for this kind of sessions in the days to come happy diwali to all thank you so much for being such a great audience i enjoyed and uh, thanks aims for giving me this opportunity once again prasad rao garu as usual uh, uh, you not only look like a rock star you are a rock star by the way you do things or the way you connect things thank you so much yeah.